terms of what I wanted to give is a perspective from what we are doing as a corporate and kind of at the end of the day, uh, uh, we, we all have a common goal. We all believe in climate change is a real problem. We all believe that 1.5 degrees we need to mitigate. Uh, and this, this problem is not going to go away. It needs a partnership among all stakeholders and this is a fantastic forum to kind of bring this up. So from a, as a corporate, as a, a company that's aspiring to be one of the largest uh, renewable energy uh, uh, solution provider, uh, our DNA has always been to decarbonize industrial, industrial segment. So, and that, is the, that has been our DNA, that is what a uh, lot of us in the company and my colleagues have been spending more than a decade in renewables, uh, trying to sell this uh, into the corporates and convincing corporates to go green. Uh, till, till, till about a long time ago, it was very hard to convince corporates because they, it, uh, green energy was much uh, more expensive than grid tariff. And at the end of the day, in India, we always look for bottom line uh, and cheap power. So nobody would actually want to give an additional uh, energy just because it's green. Today, uh, thankfully, with all the scale that's happened, we are seeing that uh, green energy is starting to become one of the cheapest forms of energy. Of course, inter intermittency is still an issue, but nevertheless, uh, for a lot amount, we are able to service uh, very competitively through green energy. Now, uh, now the point comes is how do we get into decarbonizing the entire ecosystem apart from green energy, and that's where green energy, uh, clean energy fuels come into play. And so for us as a corporate, we, uh, our vision has been to kind of uh, help to mitigate uh, climate change by addressing one part of the climate change, which is industry <laughs> carbon footprint, and kind of decarbonize that. And uh, in India right now, as it stands, I think we are at a, a kind of a, a touching point in terms of where this market can scale. Of course, there's a lot needs to be done, and we need to kind of have all our efforts on, on the table. But uh, what has been interesting is, is, is the liberalization of allowing consumers to kind of buy power on open access, being able to uh, choose where they want to source the power from. And that is one thing that has happened, you know, at, you know, India is a concurrent market, there is state markets and there is central government. At the end of the day, electricity becomes a state subject. The discoms are always worried about losing the high paying customer because we have this whole inverter structure that the wholesale uh, buyer actually pays the highest form, highest uh, energy price and because we give a lot of free power and uh, subsidized power to low income uh, categories, agriculture and all of that. Um, of course, we need to find other mechanisms to be able to compensate them. But having said that, then uh, the energy markets as a whole has to discover through common mechanism. And so one of the things that has happened is uh, the green open access policy, which kind of liberalizes liberalized the whole thing, uh, whole thing and allows consumers, anybody greater than 100 kilowatt, to be able to go and buy uh, solar or wind or any power from anywhere in the market. The other thing that has happened is, uh, there is uh, interstate. So today, uh, the market has actually opened up for us as developers to go and build a 300 megawatt or a 500 megawatt plant at the best resource location, Rajasthan, Gujarat, <coughs> Karnataka, wherever we find the best location, we go and build these wind and solar plants and we are able to deliver power pan-India because we are connected at the CTU substation and we are able to uh, deliver, a uh, customer can come in and say, I have five factories across India and I want to go have a 100% penetration of green energy, I can actually go and deliver green energy through one project. Now, what ends up happening is this again kind of creates more options for the consumer. So <coughs> this was another uh, reform that has actually kick-started this growth. And then the large large piece that I, mostly that we are going to be focusing on today is the green, and green hydrogen policy. Now, one of the very interesting ecosystems that having uh, I think uh, this was what Professor Arvind said, we were brainstorming and uh, uh, two years back pre-COVID on this idea and we actually commissioned one of the study with a think tank called Gateway House. It's one of the think tanks that uh, kind of advises Niti Aayog and everyone else and Niti Aayog was actually going the EV way. There, there were other think tanks that did a phenomenal work but we just uh, supported one of the think tanks to kind of figure out if hydrogen can be the solution to not avoid, because you're importing large amount of crude, a large amount of foreign exchange goes out uh, because we just buy crude and we are always uh, uh, exposed to the global prices on crude. If OPEC decides to increase prices, India has to pay a lot of uh, foreign exchange and that always causes problem for our fiscal deficit. So with 
this energy security starting to become a big issue, can we uh, pivot out of completely out of crude? And one of the ideas being discussed was hydrogen. India it itself has a, a fairly well established hydrogen economy. Uh, hydrogen is used in all all parts of our uh, ecosystem. Uh, there is talent available. There are enough people who know how to operate gases, manage gases, store, dispatch. All of that talent is available in India. And so this is a great way to kind of kickstart an economy of green hydrogen and kind of create an opportunity to decarbonize. So this was a, a paper that we published. I can happily share it with the group. Uh, it's available online. But that kind of kind of kickstarted some of the discussion, and I, I understand many other uh, um, think tank groups supported that uh, idea, which kind of helped to bring the green hydrogen regulation. Now, what's what's been interesting in the green hydrogen regulation, having uh, now looked at uh, because we are now also uh, uh, discussing this decarbonize agenda as one of the task force members with World Economic Forum, and one of the things that we are realizing is a lot of countries talk of uh, creating large amount of green energy projects and co-locate an electrolyzer right next to it in order to kind of generate green hydrogen out of it. What has been interesting in this policy is they have decoupled electrons and hydrogen. So it doesn't matter where your green energy comes from, let's use the grid to create green energy uh, spread and wherever there is a consumption happening, I can set up the electrolyzer and consume hydrogen because I've just bought 100% green energy through the grid. I Put, send it to my electrolyzer and I generate green hydrogen. So this is another way of uh, kind of re rethinking the paradigm in terms of what needs to happen. Of course, this is early days, so we need to create as much uh, flexibility in the system as possible to allow a green hydrogen. So these are large, uh, uh, big pieces of the ecosystem that I feel have, are setting India uh, in a very good stage to kind of take leadership on green hydrogen. Uh, so. Um, so I think today, uh, in the way we look at it, G, uh, GS2 is going to be one of the biggest disruption uh, of the century. Uh, just the concept of green hydrogen as a concept, really serious discussion only started about two, three years ago, uh, that we really started seeing a lot of this discussion. But today the amount of investments that are being promised in the system and the number of development capital that has gone in, into the green hydrogen, uh, exploring, exploring to build that business model, uh, is is amazing. There has been uh, just we are a portfolio company of Macquarie, and Macquarie itself has raised a, a energy transition fund close to more than five billion dollars. Just only focuses on creating hydrogen storage kind of opportunities globally. So that's the kind of capital that is being raised. And why this capital is being raised is because ultimately uh, the pension fund, who owns the fireman pension fund or the uh, Pro provident fund or whoever are economy uh, who runs, take, manages our day-to-day -day deposit money is taking the call that climate change is a uh, very severe risk and that has to be mitigated. So at the top end of the value chain, the <coughs> whoever holds the money is actually saying this dollars have to go to this. And so that's why you are seeing large amount of capital coming in energy transition. So, uh, in terms of what, just to give a perspective of where hydrogen is used, today hydrogen and this kind of gives an idea of where decarbonization actually comes. So today you're actually seeing refine, refineries uh, use higher hydrocarbons and there's a lot of hydrogen uh, uh, that is required. They use hydrogen as a way to remove sulfur to uh, improve air quality. Now the idea is can you uh, create mandates? So one of the ideas that's, uh, that the government <coughs> is actively thinking on and it's already, it's already written and um, notification is already being discussed. It's definitely going to come out. It's at least a 5% mandate that every refinery will have to meet green hydrogen as part of their footprint in their pipeline. So uh, this kind of uh, yeah, ideas will kick start. We're going to probably see, uh, I'm just uh, contemplating, but there could be like a SECI kind of tender saying that uh, ONGC wants to mix uh, 10,000 uh, mmt of uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, run a tender. You, you can see massive amount of green hydrogen coming in which kind of drives down the cost of hydrogen and uh, more adoption of hydrogen across the economy. Fertilizer definitely, as we all know, uh, you require uh, ammonia. So hydrogen, you, once you have created the ecosystem of green hydrogen, uh, you can very easily, today electrolyzer companies are allowing you to retrofit ammonia along with uh, green hydrogen and be able to sell green ammonia to my customers. Uh, chemicals, we're seeing that glass, uh, we're, 
and we are also learning. So uh, we are going across sitting with customers and saying, what is your uh, business case? Uh, what are you using? And we come to across like a glass manufacturer usually uses hydrogen to in improve the quality of glass to make it more clearer. So a large perfume bottle in you that you see in a duty free shop which has very clear glass is, is very clear because there's large amount of hydrogen put in during the furnace process to make it very clear. Now, that when they are actually selling a, a, a Chanel perfume, they want to show that that's 100% sustainable. Now, that has that hydrogen has to come from green hydrogen. That's an economy in itself. Uh, food hydrogenation of uh, Vanaspati, this has been going on for ages. We, so this is not a new technology. Hydro electrolyzing has been used here for the last 30, 40 years uh, here. Uh, silicon, and then there are multiple other uh, things. And then the last part is uh, power. Now, one of the things that what we see from our standpoint is we have not seen a business case of actually generating green hydrogen, storing it, and then using it as a power. It's too inefficient right now. Where we are seeing hydrogen as a business case in, in terms of input raw material. So that's where uh, it becomes sense that with this ecosystem that I talked about, we, we can actually house the electrolyzer wherever the consumption is. And uh, without large amount of storage, without large amount of pipeline, I can create an economy where there's hydrogen right next to the customer's co co consumption point and be able to size it accordingly. So that's the kind of to kind of give an ecosystem. These are large amount of ecosystems. So uh, each of these, uh, I'm not even gone transportation. I'm just talking about input fuel as a as a way to uh, figure things out. Uh, in terms of the policy standpoint, obviously there's uh, we are seeing rapid policy coming in. We are seeing that the government is listening to the developers. Um, so the uh, uh, green hydrogen, green open policy is great. It has really been uh, pushed aggressively. We are seeing a lot of deployment of that on the ground. Uh, as industry participants, we all, you see all of us as developers actively engage with the government and say, how are you get, getting this activated with no issues? Like, can, because it needs buy-in from a lot of stakeholders, including discoms and everyone else. Um, so that's a lot of uh, working going on on that. I we fa feel fairly confident that these these things are going to get activated on the ground, uh, and it's already getting done. Uh, we are already implementing projects, uh, Pan India, across uh, this um, business model. Uh, one other thing that being discussed is uh, carbon trading. In the sense, one of the big point of because hyd green hydrogen is still expensive. Let's agree, right? Grey hydrogen is going to be cheaper, and one of the ways to do is, if you're really serious, all of us agree that climate change is a serious problem, we need to kind of build a carbon market and price carbon because that price of carbon can actually become a revenue uh, line item for my green hydrogen project, which kind of brings in more green hydrogen projects to come into the market. So, um, so that's kind of, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, if I have to meet you in another six months, we probably might see some other initiatives that's being pushed in. but. I think I would most say that in India we always uh, want more and uh, we, we usually don't get it. We have to keep fighting and uh, pushing uh, the, pushing the uh, government. But it's at, at least from a trend standpoint we are seeing it going in a positive direction. Uh, in terms of green hydrogen adoption, uh, so we are right now at about 6 million uh, metric tons of hydrogen. Uh, by 2030, uh, our, these are all common numbers. We are seeing a lot of data out there. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> these numbers are kind of estimates, but we expect about 5 million metric tons of hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, uh, rest mostly because we are pushing a lot of hydrogen economy, uh, people will be having to buy 70% grey, 30% green or whatever that mix is. And in terms of cost, uh, we are seeing today green hydrogen costs around $6, uh, but it is, uh, if you look at the um, uh, notifications come like the announcements and uh, from Reliance and other things the target is to go down to two dollars or one dollar now what's been interesting is this six dollars which when we made we, we started working on this idea the six dollars seemed very high compared to what's on gray hydrogen but a lot of business uh, businesses use run gray hydrogen using uh, steam methane process SMR process and uh, they use natural gas and today with what the pricing of natural gas that has come uh, this, it's, we are already starting to be competitive on green hydrogen against them. Now, obviously, they, you can argue that it's not going to be so high for the next 20 years. And our counter argument is my, my uh, price is fixed. You don't know what Russia is going to do two years later. 
but my green hydrogen will be if i give you $5 it's going to be $5 for 20 years so you can run your business based on a fixed price without any volatility uh, and of course it will come down and it's always a consumer's choice at the end of the day whether i should need to pull the plug today and buy the green hydrogen today or i wait for 3 years and buy gray hydrogen it's a it that that question was always there in renewable energy as well should i put a rooftop today when costs are going down but at the end of the day as an opportunity cost it makes sense uh, to invest today in green hydrogen because you're going to grow at 20 30 percent kega and your requirement for hydrogen is going to be far more in uh, 10 years down the line than today right um, so just to give you an idea as to what we see in the market uh, we are seeing all large corporates taking very active <coughs> role in kind of getting to green hydrogen so of course you have reliance which is uh, made massive announcements. Uh, they have uh, working with a lot of global experts. They want to be one of the biggest competitive GH2 provider uh, in India. That's their aspiration. Uh, they are also going to be manufacturing electrolyzers in a big way. Um, of course, Adani, there's been a partnership with Total on that. Uh, Tata, we know there's a lot of discussions. LNT, LNT is actually already commissioned the first GS2 project in their own facility. It's a 300 kilowatt project. They have already facility and I think it might make sense to kind of uh, go and look at the data and see uh, how things are going. But uh, this is based on an alkaline electrolyzer. And one piece that I just want to say is what we are trying to do is, um, of course, as you guys uh, know better than me in terms of the technology, uh, there is alkaline electrolyzer and uh, PEM electrolyzer. PEM electrolyzer is a relatively new technology. But most of our projects that we are trying to build, uh, we were trying to work on alkaline electrolyzer. And we have seen, we are seeing projects in India that alkaline electrolyzers working for the last 40 years with no issues. Uh, and it gives a lot of confidence for bankability. The banks are very comfortable working on that kind of model. Um, so that's, uh, LNT has actually now actively now going and bu building out large scale uh, projects, green hydrogen projects for, uh, large orders, refineries, large, large orders being discussed right now. Um, just to kind of break down this, uh, you know, IUC, IUC has recently kick-started a 60 megawatt green hydrogen uh, project. Jindal Steel, Bina, NTPC has started doing it. So there's a lot of activity that's all, so when we have to say, okay, green hydrogen isn't going to happen, <coughs> you're actually seeing dollars being put to work. People have put money, raised debt, uh, this is like what uh, we saw solar in 2009-10, right? This is what it is. Uh, and you saw what happened to solar in the next seven years. So I think the adoption now is going to be much, much uh, faster and because we all know the space and how things are going to go uh, in this. And it's not too different than what is playing out in the, in the kind of the renewable space. And so what, just to kind of give, uh, um, wrap up as to what we are doing in green hydrogen. So uh, as a company, we have been, we are owned by Macquarie, uh, uh, portfolio company of Macquarie. So we have uh, the, uh, uh, we, they have buy, bought into our vision of being able to be one of the large clean energy uh, providers for corporate India, but also clean energy fuels, clean, clean fuels. So it's kind of an extension of sustainable energy and sustainable fuel. So it's the same company is looking to buy 7500% green energy. Now we are saying that can we use the same green energy now to expand into uh, managing your fuels? Uh, and there the, it's a different uh, value proposition. Um, we have, we, we are large development. We do all of it in-house. Uh, of course, we work with partners uh, in here. As a company, we have had a phenomenal growth rate in the last uh, 25, 22 months. We grew from 65 megawatt to 1.7 gigawatt. Uh, we just recently closed the biggest uh, solar wind hybrid project for Amazon, 476 megawatt. This is the biggest hybrid uh, for any corporate uh, off taker. And one of the ways our vision has also been to be one of the largest round the clock renewables provider. So we realized that I think what I started off saying it's already a low cost. Now my challenge is to make it 24 hours green at very competitive cost. So nobody would ever think of building a coal plant ever again. Um, it's, a, it's the activist in me kind of saying that, right? So uh, I, uh, the way I think about it is how do we get this out, right? And one thing that one thing that is hap that we started initially and today we are seeing all across corporates have bought into that is to do a wind solar hybrid. So we do now with doing projects in central grid. We have the ability to do a wind project in Gujarat, solar project in Rajasthan, 
run uh, smart uh, IOTs, technologies, asset management technologies to be able to provide a customer with a, almost a flat round the broad profile. Uh, and now if we have to add storage and some of the ideas that we do, I just have to meet the balance 20% gap. I have already solved for 80% penetration. Um, there are some regulatory hurdles, which, but technologically I, we, can make, we can deliver around the clock today. The point is, can I, it, and it can be delivered cheaper than grid too right now, but it's not as competitive right now. And that's where the trick is. But fast forward five years down the line, can it be done? No questions asked. It, I think it will definitely, we will be seeing 100% round the clock renewables here. And the point then will come to how can we pivot to fuels now that I've already solved this. So one of the ways that we are doing is we're basically creating offsite renewables everywhere. We deliver green energy to the customer's location and we build, invest our own electrolyzer capacity behind the meter for the customer. And we take this uh, fuel in green hydrogen, uh, back to the back of the envelope calculation, 75% of the cost of green hydrogen is green energy. So if I have solved green energy, Can wrap it a minute? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> if I have solved green energy, I have solved green hydrogen. So, and so I have, my given that uh, we have to solve green energy, build all this ecosystem, and then the second part is about large electrolyzer capacity to kind of do it. So this is how we are looking at how to kind of expand this and more importantly focus on input raw material within the customer's uh, requirement. Yeah. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.